Hello and welcome to Statistically Insignificant, a podcast with scrawl about statistics in the world. My name is Tess, my pronouns are she, they, and I'm here in a malaria ward trying to get the overworked staff to tell me precisely how many years of life they have saved in this community so I can write a research paper on it. Doing something actually useful and helping people around us is Bart. How's it going, Bart? Hey, how's it going? I go by he and him and that is the first time anyone's ever said that about me. (laughs) That's not true. You you perform a necessary <laughs> service in the community. <laughs> Today, we're talking about a couple of the more tenuously justified frameworks that have descended from things like transhumanism and utilitarian philosophy. Effective altruism and its far wackier, way more dangerous descendant, long-termism. As we will see, these matter because of an awful lot of rich and powerful people, including such intellectual luminaries as Elon Musk, use them to justify their power, wealth, and spending decisions. They're a worthy subject for a podcast about statistics because they, and arguably utilitarianism as well, have fundamentally quantitative aspects which tend to get less attention than the explicit philosophy. There are a bunch of primary philosophers working in this area. Effective altruism came out of the work of Peter Singer, whose basic proposition is that distance does not matter for moral imperatives. If you can save a person right next to you, and a person on the other side of the world, these have the same moral weight. We'll come back to that can later. Others have worked on that stuff, but the long-termism branch of it is being driven by the likes of William McCaskill, Hilary Greaves, and Nick Bostrom, who made his name as a transhumanist, and one of the um, more eugenics-inclined one of those, shall we say. (laughs) Among their other proponents, uh, Elon Musk apparently considers long-termism to be the closest to his personal philosophy, which is a huge red flag to me. But others among the kind of tech Silicon Valley elite are also huge fans of it, not least because it tells them that they should do what they think is best with their money. In addition to distance and space, long-termism says that the moral weight of two people are the same in time, even if one of those people doesn't exist yet. So someone who exists now, all their life, all their suffering, or not, morally equivalent to a hypothetical person, potentially billions of years in the future. In many more cases than they tell the breathless profiles of the New York Times or similar, this extends moral equivalence to hypothetical digital people that don't exist yet, and in fact may never exist about outside of sci-fi, and I wish I was joking about that part. <laughs> <laughs> it, it's kind of depressing, actually, because like these people have taken something literally from science fiction, which proposes that it is possible to recreate a human consciousness on a computer, or it will be possible at some point in the future, and said that means that those programs or whatever they look like are, for one, actually human, and for two, morally equivalent to people who currently exist. It's pretty fucked. Mm. Uh, Sort of faith in uh, technological uh, determinism is always... uh, (laughs) Troubling. Always going to end well. (laughs) Yeah. Underpinning all of these ethical systems, ideologies really, are some pretty fundamental structural problems that I want to talk about. Many other people have made these criticisms of effective altruism and similar, though I have yet to come across somebody doing an explicit and in-depth consideration of the quantitative stuff, which is what I want to focus on. If you want to look at the other stuff, uh, which is primarily like philosophical rather than statistical, there's a whole bunch of stuff in the references. So among the philosophical problems, I'm going to start by just pointing at measurement. Uh, We'll come back to this in some greater detail, but measurement is a philosophical problem because the foregrounding of quantitative methods and the assumption that you can even do it in the first place underpins basically all of these utilitarian-like systems. So they propose that you can measure the moral value of particular things and that you can directly compare them. Effective altruism, long-termism, and arguably the utilitarianism before them struggle to deal with people and all their messy reality, and instead tend to view them as vessels for value of some kind. You can see where the economists had their sticky fingers in this, for example. Uh, Value might be (laughs) happiness, might be well-being, whatever else, but it's not hard to imagine this becoming a metric for something rather darker, like usefulness of an individual to the capitalist machine. I mean, human resources and the kind of entire framework around like investing in the self through education or training or whatever else within a capitalist system kind of behaves like that, actually. But that's an mm-hmm. entirely different sort of question. Next up is the cripplingly individualist framework which goes hand-in-hand with a pretty foundational anti-systemic streak. 
effective altruism and long-termism are almost entirely focused on what the individual, usually a rich white person in a first world country, can do with their wealth under capitalism to affect change. A branch of effective altruism has actually rediscovered socialism and direct aid, <laughs> which we fucking told you so. But predominantly, they are either not interested in challenging capitalist structures. There are some among the long-termist sort of movement who actually divert their attention from climate change to speculating about super intelligence and or super artificial intelligence and how that might bring doom to the species on the basis that Climate change probably won't kill us all, so it doesn't matter as much. But there's hypothetically a super AI that could kill us all. That's really, really important. <laughs> the decisions made in the next half century will dramatically change how hard a great many future generations find their everyday lives as a result of climate change. If those lives are easier because we actually say, hey, we have a critical opportunity here, we can deal with this before it gets insurmountable, or if it is already kind of insurmountable, we can minimize the amount of damage that has happened or will happen. If those lives are easier, maybe they will be able to turn their greater time and resources to the more speculative preventative endeavors. I think this also comes alongside the individualism and like the treatment of adherence as special people, because it has to be you, the tech genius currently thinking about the problems who does the work, not that you can best set up future generations to do it by putting in the hard work, the care work, to make sure that their lives are actually better. This is why like, people like Elon Musk and – what's the name of the dude who owns Virgin? Richard Branson. Him, yes. And like Jeff Bezos and all these people. Even fucking Bill Gates. These people are convinced that they here and now are the only people who could possibly make these decisions. And importantly, that nobody else into the future would be better able to decide what people in the future need, which is slightly fucked. <laughs> I, I, I think it really comes down to the fact that these people have spent like decades being told that they are special and genius and all the rest of it. When they got lucky, yeah, like realistically, they got lucky to be in the place and time with the resources that they had. They're not orders of magnitude smarter than the rest of the world. I'm sorry. Let's turn our baleful gaze to the measurement problem. Uh, in this case, not quite the same thing as the measurement problem in quantum mechanics. Sorry. <laughs> if I am an expert in anything, it is applying numbers to stuff. And boy, do these people love to assume that they or some hypothetical person could apply numbers to moral matters. Much of what I'm about to talk about applies to the utilitarianism, which kind of predates effective altruism and long-termism, but I'm going to talk about some specific stuff that effective altruism and long-termism in particular introduce, which are like bigger problems or make those problems worse. So first up, measurement in effective altruism. I have to suppress the temptation to put scare quotes. The first problem to me is the idea of value. Quantifying this is incredibly difficult, whether it's happiness, well-being, or whatever, by which I mean assigning a numerical value to it, then going out and measuring it on a given person, even harder. Health economics has come up with a couple of um, problematic statistics related to notions of well-being in an effort to quantify the impact of health interventions and the like. So this is like what you get when you do your policy proposals is that you might measure this stuff in order to justify which policy proposal you've chosen. Yeah. So the first one is quality adjusted life years, also called Q-A-L-Y-S, qualies. This is where you have a number of years that gets weighted by the level of health that a person reports. So one year of time lived in perfect health counts as one quali. Can you hear the scare quotes? <laughs> <laughs> If you have a person whose life situation can be considered 50% of perfect health, then you would have 1 times 0 0.5 qualies, which is a half a quality, where this is your 50% of perfect health. I would say that this metric has utility for people making decisions about their own health, by offering a way to quantify what an intervention will do. So if, mm -hmm. if you have an intervention which will give you life that is half as long, but at more than double the quality, according to your own definition, by the way, let me be clear about that, you may consider that preferable to a longer life with a lower quality, according to your own definition of quality. Yeah. 
this runs into the problem of determining how on earth you give a quantitative comparison to two states of being. Certainly. So I know that there are a lot of people who, when they are planning end of life care, for example, as they are getting older and things, will say, okay, if these things happen, do not resuscitate me. And a, a lot of people seeking voluntary euthanasia, for example, say these are the things that would trigger me going to go and get voluntary euthanasia. That's a decision that people can make for their own care. It becomes a problem when these things are done on people or to people. So you have somebody, a policymaker, whatever, making decisions about the quality of life that somebody has and saying, uh, it just isn't worth supporting them in whatever form because they will have too poor a quality of life. The person whose life it is should be making that decision. For sure. Of course, there are problems around, well, if you have scarce resources as a government, you have to make some tough policy decisions. But to me, the answer is, well, don't make the resources so fucking scarce then, maybe. <laughs> No, haven't you read the uh, piece in the, I think it was the either Washington Post or New York Times where someone said that, yeah, Cuba's health system is fine, but it's because they over-resourced health. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they, they didn't put nearly enough into the well-being of their CEOs. Yeah. There have been various studies done on hospital patients and similar to get a broad quantification of various states of being. But so much of that is deeply subjective, and I would argue it can only be used as a very rough population heuristic for things like diseases. I am not at all convinced it's useful for disability or that it is able to account for the impact of access to good care because it turns out that disabilities become much less of a drain in your quality of life if you have access to the care you need. Jean-Luc Godard, the filmmaker, just died um, mm. and went into voluntary euthanasia. But in the statement release, they said oh, he wasn't really sick. He was just kind of tired of living. <laughs> that seems yeah. incalculable as like a a metric for to put on other people or whatever. Like, yeah, I've seen a couple of cases of that. Um, they usually get a fair bit of media attention, of course, because they are you know people choosing to die for reasons that are not health related. Mm. I kind of get it, but what that says to me is that potentially we are not supporting the lives of older people in a way that would be productive to them. I mean, I'm sure that he, being a renowned filmmaker, had access to better resources and better creative uses of his time than most older people. It troubles me that somebody feels like they can no longer make a contribution, I guess. Well, I would say with him specifically, he was an asshole and probably alienated everyone in his life. <laughs> oh, yes, that would also do it, right? Like, <laughs> some of it can be self-inflicted. Yeah. <laughs> so, sibling to the quality adjusted life years, and I would say much more explicitly ableist, is disability adjusted life year, or DALI. Ooh, that sounds spicy. Mmm, if I could spell it right. <laughs> This is a metric for the burden of ill health based on disability or early death. The DALI is determined to be a combination of years lived with a disability, any disability, the literature refers to burdensome disability, which is a bit problematic as well, and the years lost to dying early in comparison to typical life expectancy. Looking at the years lived with disability assumes that, for one, the best way to measure chronic illness is time, and for two, that living with a disability is pretty much morally equivalent to being dead on some level, because it's just that much of a burden on you and the community around you. Like quali, there are different weights applied to different disabilities, so the years lost to a particular disability, which is measured as years lost to disability, is the number of cases, and this is at the community level, times the disability weight. So you might consider something which is assumed to take, mean that your life, a year of your life lived as half as valuable as that of a person in perfect health, multiplied by average duration. So what that means is you may have disabilities that are somebody that affect somebody's life for a period of time and then they recover, or you may have disabilities that last the rest of the person's life and both of those kind of accounted for. There are also versions which assign a different value to the years lived as a young adult than those as either very young children or the old. So what I mean by that is you basically get, by age, something that looks like this. So this is age, uh, this is uh, waiting. And what this basically means is that this region here, which is usually the, shall we say, peak production under the capitalist model, is considered the most valuable years of somebody's life. It's not a surprise to me that this is used in a lot of 
like thinking about these sorts of things that talk about potential economic output and these things, because of course it preferences capitalism. Yeah, for sure. We as socialists also kind of sometimes look at things quantifiably in terms of like uh, moral worth, I think, when it comes to like, you know, housing, poverty, yeah, inequality, things like that. From a socialist perspective, we ask first, what do people need? Yeah. The the perspective that I could take, I would take to this sort of thing is instead of saying, well, a disability reduces somebody's quality of life or reduces the value that they hold or the value of their life, I would say instead, this person has greater need. So we have to, as the state or as somebody trying to set up something like that, provide them with more resources to account for that. Yeah, absolutely. That is, I think, radically different to proposing this sort of a system. Yeah. Once you have assumed that you can quantify the value a person contains, whether it's in expected quality or happiness or whatever, the morality of an action or event is measured by its impact on that value in some sort of totality across the population. I have ranted a lot in the past about different summary statistics, but this becomes particularly relevant when these assholes are using it to try and make policy decisions. Effective altruism has used this sort of thing to justify cost-benefit analysis of things like where does aid money get go to in poor countries. Campaigns against malaria are one example of that. A lot of external aid organizations, by which I mean aid organizations run externally to the place that is getting the help, supposedly. They are run by rich people from places like the US, and they assert that they know much better than local people where money should be spent. A number of these have been focused on malaria prevention because they see it as the greatest return in the sense of greatest quality adjusted life years increased per dollar spent. Criticism from local organizations and local people is fairly common in this context because they have other things that they see as more immediate need and a better use of that money. There's a definite paternalistic bent to this stuff because you have the people with the money, the rich people who don't live there, saying, oh, no, 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 we know better than you. We know where this should go. That's why Sankara cut off all foreign aid to Burkina Faso. is because he, yeah. is, he saw it as trying to create a dependent relationship where the foreign powers had dictate over where the money went. Look, there are concerns in a lot of these places about, like, actually getting aid to the people who need it on the ground in the sense that you don't know where the money will be spent and all that sort of thing. Yeah. But you can just say, what do you need? Go and buy the stuff and then deliver it. You don't have to assert that you know what they need. Absolutely. Let's have a look at some of these summary stuff. So if you use the total amount of value, by which I mean you just add up the value, quote unquote, in every person in a population, then your system cannot distinguish between a population with one person who contains value one and a population of 10 people, each of whom contains value 0 0.1, because both of those will add up to one. So one is one, right? But 0 0.1 plus 0 0.1 plus 0 0.1 10 times is also one. So this is this kind of is blind to population size. The other typical metric is averaging the value across the population. This has its own problems because it does not account for the distribution of value. So a population of 10 people. So in the first case, we have each with 0 0.1 value would be the same as nine with zero value and one with value one, because these would both have average value equal to 0 0.1. What is the value in this case again? Sorry. Whatever it needs to be. <laughs> yeah, because, <laughs> well, no, no, that, that's a genuine question. Because I don't think that there is anything you can quantify, let's just assume for the purpose of the rest of this, that there is some notion of value that you can quantify as a number and that you can then treat it like this. Right. I don't agree with the premise, but we can play around with the consequences, you know? Yeah. In fact, <laughs> in fact, I have right here in my notes, even if you can develop a reasonable statistical method for evaluating quote unquote value across a population, it still relies on having a valid system of value measurement, which I mentioned does not exist. <laughs> so for this next bit, let's continue by assuming that you can quantify value at an individual level. If you go to evaluate the expected impact of an action or policy, you look to the population level change and hypothesize about what potential choices will do. 
This immediately runs into yet more problems. First off, how good is your understanding of the likely impact? This gets worse the further into the future you look, so it's particularly bad for long-termism. Two, one example of this would be proposals of the earn-to-give people who claim that it would be morally justified to work for an objectionable company if enough of the money you earn is donated to a charitable cause to have an overall positive value impact, right? This pretty fundamentally misunderstands capitalism, because if you're earning a salary, then by definition you would be generating more money for the company than they're giving you for your labour. The assumption that you earn enough to compensate for the impact of the company kind of assumes that you can put your earned money to a such a more efficient sort of outcome than the company does to overwhelm whatever ne negative impact they're doing. That's an interesting proposition. <laughs> it also assumes that the negative impact of the company can be outweighed by the positive impact of whatever charity you're doing, which is dubious at best. I love to work for an oil company that pollutes whole areas of the planet so I can make a bit of money to a charity for sick brown children in the third world. <laughs> I find this kind of evaluation of labor under capitalism particularly objectionable because it's basically impossible to do an actual calculation. These effective altruists and the people who talk about earn to give love to do hypotheticals because you can't actually do the fucking calculation itself. Not least because if you're outside a company looking in and you want to hypothesize about the impact of a job there, the company is opaque to you. You don't get to see their internal structures. You may or may not know anything about their supply chains, their material impacts on the world, what they are doing at very bottom level to top level in terms of how they interact with their workers or the people supplying them or the people in communities around where they do stuff. This gets more and more abstracted the further you go into sort of financializing this. A lot of effective altruism around this sort of thing is talking about people going into share market trading or whatever else, which is so abstracted from the actual material impact of companies doing stuff in the world that it's not meaningful to propose to measure this. That's never changed any of these people's propositions and like a lot of it seems to be, hey, if you think the vibes of working there will be better than the vibes of not, go for the vibes of working there. At least you'll be comfortable <laughs> and able to feel good about giving stuff to charity. I am in a sort of fiction subculture where I've seen a lot of defenses of someone working for Raytheon. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yes, I, I believe I've heard of that one. <laughs> This kind of moral act comparison also assumes that you can directly compare the impact of any two options, which is just bizarre. This is a point that Eric Hull has actually made as well. But there are more differences than just the quantitative between moral acts, because human behavior and society is way too complex to deal with in that kind of one-dimensional fashion. So what I mean by that is if, if you have two things two possible choices that you can make, and you have been able to assign a moral value to each, there are still qualitative factors that will make those different choices, and that can't be easily converted to the quantitative measurement. We'd call this a partially ordered set, so for any two actions you have, you may or may not be able to make a valid comparison of their impact. That's what partial ordering means. It's extremely common for people to make this mistake when they start using numbers for things, because numbers are not partially ordered. They have what's called a total order. For any two numbers, you can pick out the bigger and the smaller value. It's just that the thing you are assigning the numbers to probably doesn't have that structure as well. Isn't it funny how we keep coming across these situations where numbers are a bad tool? <laughs> it's interesting that the focus there is on so, for example, if this was a philosophy aimed at sort of normal people, it would kind of make sense. Like, uh, do I manufacture cars, for example? Cars, not great for the environment, like um, burn fuel and stuff. But also, I have to sell my labor to survive and to be able to have a family yeah. and all that sort of thing. But it's very telling that the abstraction goes to, like, stock trading and shit where – most normal people will not have access to that. Yeah, this like, is absolutely not targeted yeah. at ordinary people. They're too boring. They don't have enough moral decisions or power to make moral decisions or money to make moral decisions about spending. <laughs> don't worry about them. 
I will also point out that effective altruism shows its biases and what it considers to evaluate from a moral standpoint, which is basically always about giving money in some form. If they were serious, they would incorporate things like, oh, I don't know, stochastic terrorism against billionaires. Are you morally obligated to try and kill Elon Musk? I mean, yes, but no one has the guts to do it. <laughs> that is not an actionable threat. I am asking a <laughs> hypothetical question here, right? If they were serious, they would look at these things. But of course, those are the kind of people that effective altruists want to attract and what they want to be as well. So this sort of stuff just doesn't get talked about. Let's get to the ways that long-termism makes all of these issues way worse. The moral equivalence between existing people and potential people means that the shortcomings of analyzing value for existing people extends to people who don't exist yet, whose experiences of life and expectations may be unimaginable to us. Imagine somebody 200 years ago hypothesizing about the moral value of logging off of Twitter. Multiply that out to literally millions or billions of years into the future. This gets at the heart of my statistical complaint with long-termism. It proposes to anticipate future events so remote and be able to evaluate current choices made now for their potential impact on those future events. They cloak this in a kind of hand-wavy notion of, oh, we'll just look at it probabilistically and discussion of existential risks. But I'm sorry, you are proposing probabilities and you are proposing things related to those long-term probabilities about, oh, one's higher than another. You cannot make that judgment. They clearly have no fucking idea how to translate any of this to, not, I don't even necessarily want a concrete number. I want a reasonable idea of where they get that ordering from, and they <laughs> cannot tell me. Hell yeah. For example, there's a lot of literature from these people hypothesizing about what ex existential risks there are, by which they mean events which would kill off humanity into the long term, or rather more extravagantly, prevent humanity from spreading across space and time and colonizing at least this galaxy and possibly others. We have no fucking idea how that would, what that would look like realistically. I mean, we can think of some possible ways, like some technologies based on what exists now that would be required to do that sort of traveling with physical human bodies, but we don't know what would actually be required in a thousand, ten thousand years with the society that exists then and the people that exist then to actually build it. To the most hardcore, or at least most publicly honest, of the long-termists, this picture of the far future is the main moral question. I mean, there's a very interesting sort of linguistic trick that gets played. If you look at the long-termist writing for themselves, they will use the main moral question or the moral imperative, where it's the most important one, right? Yeah. Whereas long-termist stuff written for general consumption or their marketing material says so it is a moral question or a imperative. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's very distinct what they focus on because they've discovered that actually uh, the general population is smarter than they think and look at their propositions of stuff in the long term and go, what the fuck are you talking about? This is bullshit. <laughs> to the long-termist, anything that could reduce the likelihood of of this long-term, glorious, bright future of populating an entire galaxy is anathema. They're very concerned with things like genocidal artificial superintelligence, global pandemics. I mean, shout out to them for being concerned about that pre-2020, I guess. <laughs> but they mean, like, specifically global pandemics that are engineered and actually kill off an awful lot more people than COVID did. But they are not necessarily concerned about climate change because they don't see it as something that's likely to kill everyone. And uh, there's no small amount of, shall we say, eco-fascism in the approach which says, well, we just need to reduce the population enough and climate change is going to help us do it. So it's not that <laughs> bad, actually. This seems uh, in uh, conflict with the idea that of, of a larger population with a slightly lower... Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, you see... What we have to do now in order to guarantee that may be objectionable to the people <laughs> now. But, I mean, what really matters is that we are able to get to those, you know, Dyson swarms around d distant black holes or whatever else. Mm. The, like, the fundamental fact that an awful lot of poor brown people in equatorial countries are going to die under climate change as we understand it to be happening is not important to them because that loss of value 
quote unquote, and let's be honest, how much value can such lives really have in such deprived conditions, they would ask, pales in comparison to the billions of potential people in the far future whose existence is, by the dubious calculations of long-termists, made more possible by their focus on things like colonizing Mars. I also think we should we have to stop talking about climate change as a future um, value in that. Like I know, millions right? of people are dying <laughs> like right now. now <laughs> like, yeah. Yeah, I mean, the, there's the drought conditions in the Horn of Africa. Uh, if you have not looked those up and you want to depress yourself for the foreseeable future, go do that. And then look at how much money is proposed would be needed to fix this problem, and then look at how much, for example, the Australian government is proposing in tax cuts in the next 10 years. <laughs> I find it very telling that, once again, these people assume that they, in the time we are in and in the places that they live, are the most important people to make those long-term predictions and decisions. It just tells me they go literally fucking nothing about the actual process of how one could predict future events. Everything I said about the difficulty of modelling a system in our episode on chaos and randomness applies here. Even if the world is deterministic, which I think is a fair argument, that doesn't mean we can predict what will happen in the future because we don't have enough information or a good enough understanding of the world as it exists now. Even if we did have a perfect model, as in we understood all the deterministic rules which say if this thing happens now, then this thing will happen in the future, our ability to observe the conditions now mean that we, uh, we can't predict very far into the future because a small difference in those starting conditions translates to a large difference in the long term. Weather prediction, we can't do that more than five days out very accurately, right? Mm. Why the fuck do we think we can predict anything else, <laughs> like a thousand, five thousand, whatever years in the future? It's fucking stupid, I'm sorry. One example of the sort of fanciful predictions made are various numbers thrown about regarding the population of the far futures under various scenarios. Now, some of them have acknowledged that it's pretty meaningless to throw such numbers out as explicit numerical calculations, and instead prefer to talk about relative population potentials. You can think of this as like two Earth-like planets, so let's say pretty much identical to Earth as exists now, can support a greater population than just one. So in many of these scenarios, you can have a bit more of a reasoned arguments about those. So you could say like, well, if we have a situation where we can travel between galaxies, that opens up more potential population than just being stuck in this one. The fact that we don't know whether or not what we're doing now can actually change the, our ability to move between galaxies hasn't occurred to them. <laughs> Unfortunately, most long-termists promptly get on their bullshit about digital people and start hypothesizing about how many of those could exist in imagined computers of the future, based on this assumption that it is even possible to build a computer which can run a human consciousness. They then start claiming that all these digital people represent a bigger population than could exist as flesh and blood humans, whatever that might mean in such a situation in the far future with evolution, blah 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 blah. Because there are hypothetically orders of magnitude more digital people that could exist, then that's the future we should work for, as if we could predict that. And, like, as if that is our decision to make. <laughs> You've kind of lost me here. <laughs> this makes no sense. <laughs> no, well, that's because it is pretty much nonsensical, right? <laughs> Let, let's imagine a future in which you can put, you can have a human as in a program on a computer which simulates a human consciousness. Hypothetically, let's pretend that this could exist. To a long-termist, that is a human with exactly the same moral weight as a flesh and blood human. And because that moral equivalent extends over time, that digital consciousness is morally equivalent to a long-termist to a person who exists now. Oh my god. <laughs> I know, it's fucked. They hypothesize about future society's ability to create these digital people and claim that we should maximize the number of those digital people that exist. I would like a ban on hard sci-fi. <laughs> I think this would solve uh, a lot of problems. Convinced that's hard sci-fi, <laughs> like, to be perfectly honest. <laughs> In the face of all that non-existent ability to meaningfully predict what actions now will lead to outcomes in the far future, long-termism assigns a moral value to current acts based on their expected value, by which they mean the expected impact of that act on the number of people who can exist billions of years in the future, potentially, and computers. 
My least sincere apologies to these people, but it doesn't fucking work like that. <laughs> you can't assign a probability or a ranking of possible probabilities to the outcome of each moral action now based on this kind of bullshit predictions in the hypothetical long future. In particular, you can't do that and then, I quote, take the action that is best compromised between these views, the action with the highest expected value, which is what one of these research papers proposes. <laughs> it just doesn't work. This is the worst example of, like, armchair philosophical hypothesizing because these people are quite deliberately infiltrating policy institutes and decision makings like i know the un is fucking useless but when these people try are actively trying to get influence with the un i can see that having some pretty devastating problems absolutely i propose an alternative way to ensure that humanity has the chance to get off the planet. I'm not going to hypothesize about the far-flung future. Let's just say that, yes, at some point in time, chances are we will need to get off the planet if our species is going to survive into the far future. I think that's pretty reasonable to say, right? In my imagined future, we have a system where everybody has access to a good minimum standard of living, we have public infrastructure that enable their lives to be productive and fulfilling, and we redirect all of the labor that is not focused on ensuring that minimum level of like living towards stuff that would help us get off the planet. Because if you have a good standard of living, you will be much more able to spend your rest time and your recreational time, which you will have a re as a result of that good standard of living, to idly hypothesizing about, well, this might be an interesting idea to try, or learning stuff that would enable you to get to these sorts of new ideas that we would need. There is so much labor that is currently wasted churning the big money handle to make capitalism go around <laughs> through bullshit jobs and whatever else. That could be redirected. Of course, this requires that people like Elon Musk be, shall we say, relegated to a position without the kind of power that they are comfortable holding, and they don't get to feel like super special boys for making big decisions about the future. The care work required to get us to that point where we could sustain an extended space project just to provide for the people back on Earth is huge and basically unacknowledged by these assholes. It's a very notable irony that, that these people like love a sort of system with profit when the only reason we got off the planet in the first place is because there was a country that didn't have profit as its primary mechanism of yeah so i would say the ussr didn't have that for sure that was part of what enabled them to do it but even in the us the state had to exercise controls over production in order to get that research done and get that stuff developed one of the other things that i find kind of funny is that all of like Elon Musk's dreams about living on Mars just completely ignore how much Earth-based stuff is required to support even like a dozen people on the International Space Station. There are thousands and thousands of people whose lives are dedicated to keeping a few people up uh, alive in this box in space. And, like, space is so hostile to human life that that increases by orders of magnitude the further you get from Earth and the more people you have. So, like, of course we're going to still need reasonable stuff on Earth for long into the foreseeable future. Well, also, isn't Mars too close that if, like, Earth was having a problem with existence, Mars would also have that problem with existence? Um, no. I mean, it depends on what the problem is. So, okay, so here we're going to get into wacky existential hypotheticals, right? If you have something like... A, media, a, a, a planet killer meteor hitting Earth. Mars is not affected by that, right? Ah, right. Yeah, yeah. So these are the sorts of things that they're imagining. If you have something like the sun expanding into its red giant phase and getting to the point where Earth is no longer habitable, Mars may still be habitable at that point. And in fact, maybe more habitable than it currently is because it'll be a bit warmer. Oh, okay. I thought it would be conceivably like uh, in trouble if it, uh, if the sun expands. Oh, look, there are there are lots of other problems that might like present difficulties for both. Like, let's say that you get some sort of genocidal super intel artificial intelligence going, right? That will find out that there's people on both Earth and Mars, and presumably, if it's genocidal, want to kill both of those. I, I think it's much more likely that we will get an Earth killer asteroid hitting Earth than that we will see such a problem. To be <laughs> for sure. Honest. So the, the framework that I'm proposing for a guaranteeing a long-term future is built on a handful of assumptions, like anything are. For one, 
People who have a good minimum standard of living will be better able to think beyond their immediate survival, and so be better able to make choices which best guarantee the living standards of their descendants. This is pretty common sense as far as I'm concerned, but you also see a lot of like sociological research and even public health research which supports this idea. People who are desperate to survive literally have fewer resources and less brain space to contemplate other stuff. Two, a society which is not compelled to maximally exploit every resource is much less likely to deplete any of those without replacement, or produce a situation where it is impossible to adapt one resource becoming untenable and move to another one. The transition to renewable energy is a pretty good example of this, as is just-in-time manufacturing and all the hell that caused during the early days of COVID because there was just no give in the system because it was set up to maximize the extraction and maximize the profit. Three, and this is the kind of like something that Elon Musk appears completely capable of considering, people in the future will be better able to decide what their particular circumstances require in order to guarantee their survival than we can, here and now. <laughs> and we are best off giving them as good a shot at that possibility as possible by building a world where their lives are not precarious, where they are able to advocate for their own material conditions, and they are not burdened by the worst effect of climate change. But again, that means you don't get to be the super special boy who makes the big decisions for 50 million years in the future or whatever the fuck. It seems like all of these things that there's like, if you go to like one of those uni uni like elite universities like Harvard or um, Cambridge, like one of the jobs you can get is just like being the sort of court priest to our new like <laughs> feudal yeah, yeah, yeah. ruling class. I mean, so a lot of these people are based out of Oxford. And, like, there's a bunch of think tanks that have been built around, like, long-termism and effective altruism. They seem to be uh, moving away from those names. I can't imagine why with all the press that they're getting, right? <laughs> but basically, there is an incentive for people, and a lot of economists have been getting in on this as well, of course, to come up with these ethical systems – ideological systems which appeal to the very wealthy because that's a great way to get a lot of funding i was thinking out of uh out of harvard like um i think um mm. what's his name malcolm gladwell carries a lot of similar thinking around even if, if it's not the exact same uh yeah branch and it just seems like he gets to be the sort of <laughs> person super that, special boy yeah yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the person yeah. that rich people just have hang around them kind of thing yeah, well, it's <laughs> it's amazing how uh, profitable at the individual level it can be to tell to tell incredibly wealthy people, no, no, you can make decisions that don't <laughs> challenge your actual way of living. You have the power and the moral justification to do things that you think are right. I said Gladwell, but I actually hate Pinker way more because he's a much sloppier mm. thinker. Yeah, it's also like the the quantification stuff i find a really big problem in utilitarianism more broadly and and stephen pinker is primarily a utilitarian i do think that he has some good points particularly around the treatment of animals and things but but in big glowing neon letters <laughs> he is lazy in his efforts to actually justify those like the moral ordering of actions basically yeah i i consider mathematics to be a branch of applied logic but I wish more philosophers had even looked vaguely at statistics at some point in their lives, <laughs> because I think it would really help with a lot of this stuff. I don't know. Sometimes you just want to watch a Slavoj Zizek movie where he just makes some wild, unfounded claims and <laughs> not all. <laughs> yeah, yeah, look, I, that, I can, that I can perfectly understand. <laughs> So that's enough of ranting about this, uh, effective altruism and its problems and long-termism and how batshit insane it is. But you actually gave me some content for a, uh, a mailbag segment. So let's go have a look at that. Hell yeah. So this is a chart that you saw on Twitter. Uh, it's taken from a um, Nature article about that was October last year? No, October this year, by Sholey... Surely? I can never remember what the All Night actually does. At L2022, the reference will be in the notes. Basically, you just told me that you didn't quite understand how to read this. Yeah. So let's have a look. Uh, this comes from a, an article in Nature Human Behavior, um, and it's looking at the change in life expectancy across 29 countries since the onset of the 2019 pandemic. Because this is an article about life expectancy, I want to say 
that we did a whole episode about how these sorts of statistics are calculated. You can go and find that in our back catalogue. But basically, life expectancy is the expected duration of your life from birth in a given country at a given time. It's a combination of death of death records, so how old people are when they die, and some statistical finagling to adjust that data to reflect the lives of people now are not the same as the lives of people, say, 50 years ago or whatever. Mm -hmm. This particular chart here is showing the change in calculated life expectancy for a bunch of countries across 2019, 2020, and 2021, with additional data for the years 2015 to 2020, 2019, sorry, as comparison. Down here on the y-axis, you can see that uh, the country is chosen. The authors did not decide to say why those particular countries were chosen. Sure. <laughs> it, look, it could be some combination of what data was accessible, but also they were focused on Europe and North America, it seems. The Imperial Call. Yeah, the Imperial Call, let's say. Let's have a look at some of these numbers. So the first thing to look at in this chart is this, what they've ri written here as Delta E0. This is the change in uh, life expectancy measured in months. So what this says is, this first one says is that between 2019 and 2021 for Bulgaria, they saw a minus 43 months in expected life. These columns next to it, 2019 to 2020, 2020 to 2021, break up that overall expected change into the two years. This last column looks at the average per year between 2015 and 2019. So basically what you could do from this is pull this one up the top. You can say that in the two years since the start of the um, COVID pandemic, the expected life um, in Bulgaria has dropped by 43 months in comparison in each year between uh, 2015 and 2019, the life expectancy increased by about one and a half months. Right. So uh, this has been ordered by the the most negative change. So this one up the top, Bulgaria, at minus 43 months is the most extreme. And as it goes down right to the bottom, you see Norway, which has actually seen an increase of 1.7 months. Mm -hmm. This first, like, this part of the actual chart which I imagine is what was particularly confusing for you to read. How we do this is that if the arrow is colored red, then it is negative. It is a decrease in life expectancy. It's got two pieces. So this first piece is the change in 2020. This second piece is the change in 2021. So that comes down to here. And then the total change is the, port is the distance from where the arrow starts to where the arrow ends. Oh. Yeah. So the reason that they have done it like that is that in a bunch of these countries, you see a decrease in life expectancy during 2020, but then a slight increase or a substantial increase during 2021. Mm -hmm. If we look at England and Wales here, over 2020, you have this decrease of about uh, 12 months, looks like. And then over 2021, you see an increase here of about maybe two months. Mm -hmm. And that means that the total net change is from here where it started to where it ended here. And that you can rep is represented by this number. Yeah. Yeah, this is like, I get why they presented it like this, but it is confusing when you first look at it. What they were particularly interested in doing in this paper was not just looking at the proportion, the change for each country, but also looking at within a particular country, uh, how that is split up by age group, because we know that deaths to COVID were stratified by age. What is interesting is that you can see, like somewhere the, like the United States, where they killed off most of their very old people who were vulnerable to this in 2020, you see a huge drop in the um, life expectancy, particularly among that group in 2020. But during yeah. 2021, there was a much bigger drop in life expectancy for people who were under 60. Right. So the impact of COVID has not been equally distributed over time and age, mm -hmm. not least because in places like the United States, the very old died first. <laughs> yeah. Uh, one other thing to notice is that if you look at this uh, x-axis down here, this is by months, yeah. not by years. So it's not quite as dramatic as it first looks, but this would be one year with 12 months. This would be two years. This would be three years. Mm -hmm. 
The other thing that they were really interested in looking at in this paper was the impact of things like um, vaccination rates. So unsurprisingly, countries that had higher vaccination rates were less likely to see a large negative impact. And countries with higher vaccination rates were more likely to see this sort of U-turn. So they may have had a large impact in the first year, but the impact was re- like decreased or even reversed in the second year. Yeah. Basically, what that looks like is once vaccines were available and they vaccinated people, survival rates went up. So you didn't have this massive negative impact on the um, life expectancy. Yeah. I was very interested to see that, like, well, India, for example, is not here. This is potentially due to missing data and things. But India, I don't trust the official statistics to come out of India in the sense that, like, they're the deaths that they attributed to COVID just based on what was being observed at crematoriums and things seems to have been a massive underestimate of the actual number of people who were dying. But like you can do this based on excess deaths and things like that. And the actual like, Oh, that's another thing that they did look at in the paper is that they looked at what of the change could be attributed to COVID itself. And what of the change could be attributed to other forms of other reasons for mortality. Yeah. And the United States is an interesting case study there because the United States prior to COVID was already seeing like decreasing life expectancy from all causes. And from COVID has also seen decreased life expectancy from things other than COVID. Yeah. So basically, shit's getting bad over there. Absolutely. Yeah. All right. I think that is a podcast. But thank you so much. Thank you as ever for having me. I'll talk to you next time. Speak to you then.